So we are, let's uh, <coughs> take a breath and we're gonna have our opening reflection. And um, I was actually thinking about when I was, I don't know, thinking about what, what would be a good opening reflection. I was kind of thinking of kind of along the lines of how you're feeling, Pam, and how I was feeling and kind of trying to get started again. And even in terms of this garden group, you know, like so many things, I don't know, it, life it, it's moving on and we know that and it's changing and it's different, but I'm not sure exactly what I was searching for. But anyway, I ended up looking at, I have the, um, I'm going to be reading from the prophet, which is very, it's like the best selling book of you know, one of the best selling books is by um, Khalil Gibran. It was written in 23. Um, and he's just, a, he's a poet. Um, it was written in English. He's Lebanese American, but he, it was written in English from the start. And what this book is, it's actually a book of 26 prose poetry fables. And um, in the fable, it, it's a, the fable is about a prophet, Al-Mustafa, who he's lived in this city of Orphalese for 12 years. And he's getting ready to get on a ship to go back to his homeland. So he's leaving this city, this place. And um, as he's leaving, all the people kind of come from whatever they're doing and they gather like, you know, and before he leaves, they, they just want to get, you know, wisdom about life and the human condition. Apparently and they want to ask him, you know, er, and different people, every chapter is a different person asking him a question and um, trying to get as much guidance from him as they can before he leaves. And so it's on all different topics, as you can imagine. And I chose the chapter titled On Beauty. And uh, it's a poet that asked the question um, and I'll read the whole thing, but, uh, and to summarize, Mustafa, Al Mustafa, he answers, um, that when a person seeks beauty, it's beauty herself must be the way and the guide. When someone speaks to her, which is beauty, when someone speaks to beauty, she, beauty, will be the source of their words. And um, as you listen to the reading, you'll see the message that beauty is different for everyone, and it can be described in different ways. Um, and you can, you know, it's a philosophy book i mean <laughs> the interpretation of this gets pretty deep you know and i mean each description that he gives is like it, it, um an interpretation is that you know each description of beauty reflects an unsatisfied spiritual need of the of the definer um but overall the message the prophet's message is that beauty is not an unsatisfied unsat need Rather, it's something that is spiritual in nature and it's eternal. It never fades. It's forever in bloom. And um, it's the beauty within us and without us that's there for us to connect with. And, um, and then it talks about when we're looking at beauty, we're looking at a mirror. I mean, we're looking at ourselves. So it's kind of this, to me, it related to gardening because the other thing that the other point that I the thing that kept coming into my mind this this week and does a lot a lot of times is just how unique everyone's garden is you know when someone's into it's like you can see their personality by going and looking at their garden you know and when you're it's it's like people are looking to beauty to nature to define like they're connecting something within themselves and it's a reflection of themselves so it just sort of all relates to me that this thing about gardening and there's no one definition of what's the most beautiful garden because they're all beautiful we're all beautiful you know it's 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 a, cre a creative outlet we know that you know we know it in those terms but this just to me i could see that connection when you're talking about gardening so i will start Hi, Bill. Okay. Oh, I can't hear you now because you're muted, but that's okay. I get it. <laughs> so the chapter is, um, of course, he's all the 
village people are gathered around and people are taking turns asking questions. And a poet said, speak to us on beauty, of beauty. And he answered, where shall you seek beauty and how shall you find her unless she herself be your way and your guide? And how shall you speak of her beauty except she be the weaver of your speech? The aggrieved and the injured say, beauty is kind and gentle. Like a young mother, half shy of her own glory, she walks among us. And the passionate say, nay, beauty is a thing of might and dread. Like the tempest, she shakes the earth beneath us and the sky above us. The tired and weary say, beauty is of soft whisperings. She speaks in our spirit. Her voice yields to our silence as like a faint light that quivers in fear of the shadow. But the restless say, we have heard her shouting among the mountains and with her cries come the sound of hooves and the beating of wings and the roaring of lions. At night, the watchmen of the city say, beauty shall rise with the dawn from the east. And at noontide, the toilers and the wayfarers say, we have seen her leaning over the earth from the windows of the sunset. In winter, say the snowbound, she shall come with the spring leaping upon the hills. And in the summer heat, the reapers say, we have seen her dancing with the autumn leaves and we saw a drift of snow in her hair. All these things have you said of beauty. Yet in truth, you spoke not of her, but of needs unsatisfied. And beauty is not a need, but an ecstasy. It is not a mouth thirsting, nor an empty hand stretched forth, but rather a heart inflamed and a soul enchanted. It is not the image you would see, not the song you would hear, but rather an image you see, though you close your eyes, and a song you hear, though you shut your ears. It is not the sap within the furrowed bark, nor the wing attached to a claw, but rather a garden forever in bloom and a flock of angels forever in flight. People of Orphales, beauty is life when life unveils her holy face, but you are life and you are veil. Beauty is eternity, eternity gazing at itself in a mirror, but you for eternity, and you are the mirror. Isn't that beautiful? You have to get in kind of a deep <laughs> place. That's why I went on and on before. It's like, I don't know. I just, you read those chapters and there's, you could read it again and again, and other things in that book on various things. But. We're always looking at beauty in the face when we're trying when we're nurturing our gardens, aren't we? <laughs> aren't we saying? <laughs> I know this is a shallow, maybe more shallow interpretation, but it's like you gotta listen. I don't know. Nature is beautiful to me, the whole everything. And we're part of it, I guess, you know. But you gotta listen, right? You gotta try to be in tune. That's part of the whole thing. So um it's hard not to listen to your beautiful bird song. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. They're so, yeah. Was it you? Oh, I was talking to Linda one time on the phone and um, it was cold. It was cold morning <clears throat> and I was sitting out on the porch and I said, oh, the birds are just so energetic and happy. <laughs> and Linda said, they're cold. They're, they're moving around a lot because they're called Becky. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, well, um, 
I think we'll start with, uh, w will I be able to share? You've set it up so I can share the screen, right? I'm sure he probably did. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I can. We'll see. <laughs> oh, okay. Disable participant sharing screen. So if you, let's see. Are, are you on a laptop? Yes. Um, why don't you try try to um, can? Okay. <laughs> so Terry, um, let's see. Terry uh, recorded her. Um, it was an i. It's an iMovie. Let's see. Let's if I can get this to go away. Then I've got the iMovie, and we will watch it. And everybody mute. You might be muted anyway. I'm not, but. It might be a minute because it has to open my iMovie, I guess. I should have done, there we go. Hi everyone, it's Terry, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about urban composting. Since this is the first time in my life that I've ever recorded a video, I'm hoping that you'll give me a little bit of leeway with it. When we first started talking about composting, I mentioned that I live in a city area and I wasn't interested in attracting larger mammals to my yard, so I wanted to be really careful with how I did composting. And also because it's just me, um, and I take care of my mom here, um, I didn't want to get into too large of an operation that I couldn't maintain or physically handle. So I've tried to, uh, Learn a little bit as we go about it along the way and keep it small. We'll see if I was successful at it. Remember last year when we laughed at me because I was actually cutting up banana peels for the compost pile? And everybody laughed and giggled because Terry was being so anal <laughs> about it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you're doing urban composting and you don't have a big compost pile, you have a small one, it's not a bad idea to cut up almost all of your fibrous items and make sure that they are um, in small enough pieces that they'll break down in at least 8 to 12 weeks of time. So, the handiest thing for me has been to keep, uh, if I can show it here, a little mushroom box okay right on my kitchen counter and as i get waste i throw it in there and you'll notice that there's actually some compostable plastic wrap in here i read somewhere about how quakers were uh people who put their money where their mouth was uh and <laughs> so i put 38 dollars worth of my money where my mouth was and got a bunch of compostable bags and compostable plastic wrap because i was just having a hard time giving up the 1960s plastic wrap revolution that I grew up in. Remember Benjamin and the graduate? Well, at least if you have 38 bucks, you can get around that. A uh, couple of added benefits from composting right here is that uh, we also remember mentioned I was doing uh, my coffee cups in K cups. Now I'm using reusable ones. And I'm finding that I can just, because believe it or not, coffee grounds are green. Um, they go right in my little blue thing. Uh, I empty them out, put them in the dishwasher, which is next to me on the top rack. And they are uh, easily cleaned up and easily then put back into production. I also maintain over this way a foil ball. So you can see all my different kinds of foil from this week. And then I just ball it up and put it in there recycling when it comes. So let's go out and take a look. Oh, one more thing here before we go. The other problem with urban composting is that you don't want to keep it big or, or have a lot to work with, but I also don't want to be running to the compost bin all the time. So I also have uh, various packages of some sort. Uh, this is a Meyer ice cream bucket with a lid, and I pour the compost from here into here and then when these get full they go outside and I'll show you what I'm going to do with those. But I also use things like uh, Folgers coffee, ground coffee, plastics, anything that I can do with uh, 
items that I've purchased that have come in plastics with lids that can be reused or also be used of this. So I'll see you outside in just a minute. So here we are outside. We're on the side of my house, okay? And this is my composting station. Uh, I bought a little, I think it's a miracle Grow composter, and it holds several gallons of compost. It's not nearly enough for uh, all of the production or all of the particular plantings that I have, but it's enough to make a little bit of a difference for me. So we'll come over here and we'll take a look at it. Inside the composter, Ooh, I've got some ready to go. I don't know if you can see that or not, but um, I've got plenty of nice, rich compost in there that I can now empty out. I keep a tarp, a blue tarp over here that I place under the composter. And that's what I use when I uh, empty it out, just empty it out underneath. And every few days I come in and turn the composter, okay? So kind of easy to do, but if you notice, it doesn't make a ton of compost at a time. And if you remember, I said eight to 12 weeks. So this isn't a handy dandy one, like if you have a big tall one where you can scoop from the bottom and then keep adding things to the top. I can only uh, compost in one batch. So I have to be pretty darn sure that I, uh, the batch is small enough, it has enough browns in it, and then I'm ready to turn it. So, But in the summertime, 8 to 12 weeks will work just fine for me, so I'll get several batches done. This batch has been cooking since April the 1st, and it's ready to go. I, I If you notice, I also have a rather unique set of bins, okay? Because you get ahead of yourself as you're composting. Now, a lot of people recommend much larger bins, uh, composting items themselves and a lot of people recommend uh, that you have at least two of them I didn't have the money to invest in that so I'm doing this kind of situation and if you take a look in here you'll see that I have a bin full of oh, here's some recycled and shredded paper that I have used somebody shipped me a lot of paper thank you Amazon okay so I just shred it and then I keep it in here. It's part of my burn. Also in here, and I don't know if you can see them, but over there are two beautiful trees in a common area and they give us a ton of leaves. So I go over in the fall and I collect bags of leaves and there's at least one down in here somewhere uh, that I still have from last year where I uh, let them sit and make sure I keep them dry and I use those also for my browns. And then I promised you the rather disgusting view. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> All right. And it smells when you open it up, of course. Uh, of all the things I'm saving to put, oh, here's just a plastic bag full of stuff, okay, to put into the next batch. So my next batch is ready to go, as you can see. And then I'll clean up my bins and uh, give them a chance to air out before I start in on them again. But that's been the biggest consideration, is that you have to think about the fact that not only do you have a batch in progress, and your batch in progress is going to take eight to 12 weeks. Don't let them fool you and let you believe it's only six. Um, eight to 12 weeks in the summertime, longer in the winter, uh, if you can get it to compost it all in the winter. And then um, a, a means to have the rest of your stuff ready that is hopefully animal proof. And I've not had any problems with animals with this arrangement whatsoever. So if you're wondering what I do with the finished goods and the reason I compost in general, and that is because I have a vegetable garden. Right here. And you can see all my little marigolds that are volunteering, <laughs> okay? But I have a vegetable garden right here, and I just use the compost that I make to enrich this garden every year. Those of you who are in church today heard about my bountiful strawberries. I'm uh, busy cleaning these up and picking the last of them, I hope, but we'll see. Um, they've sure been a blessing this year.
So my goals were small. Uh, if I had to save, did it save any money? I would probably tell you absolutely, positively, no. Uh, you could buy a plastic bag of miracle Grow, which would give me about the same amount of compost as I get out of my uh, whole compost bin, but you wouldn't have the joy of doing it yourself and adding to your own garden when you do it. So urban composting isn't that different than any other composting. It's just that the scale of your composting activity is going to dictate somewhat um, your methodology. So just keep that in mind. But is it hard? Well, if I can do it, anybody can. So I just wanted to say to everyone, it's really nice to meet with you. Sorry that I'm in uh, on vacation today and I'll see you next time. Take care. Sorry about that. It, when I, I muted myself like a good girl. And then how much did you miss because I muted that? Very much. I, I think at the beginning, she was just saying um, she was trying to do it in such a way to keep the critters out. And she hadn't had problems. Um, but anyway, so um, I'm just now setting my alarm so that, um, okay, so that I get a alarm when I should quit because I'm going to do the rest of this. So any thoughts or um, reflections or on, if Terry were here, we could ask her questions. Oh, um, I do want to add because she, after she sent this to me, she said that if she left a few details out in the interest of time um, and just fumbling with the camera and stuff, but um, so she, the couple things she would have added about composting is almost every bit of yard waste is fibrous. Iris leaves, even chopped when used green, take forever to compost. Okay, so the first one is almost everything yard waste is fibrous. And then she said iris leaves, even when chopped, they take forever. So not a good one to compost. So she said... Um, well, if you're going to use iris leaves, let them completely die off, turn brown, and then it's easier to use them as compost browns. Um, and then she said, it doesn't pay to try to compost every single bit of organics. For example, stock ends of corn cobs. Those don't compost quickly, I guess. Um, thank them for coming, the corn cobs and uh, to your party <laughs> and then let them decompose in the city trash she said so those are the things she would have said had she thought of it or had time so um i have something in the chat is that one we couldn't okay that's when you said you have no sound okay so i am gonna move on quickly because we didn't have i ended up saying okay I'm gonna show my garden I guess because you know we, we had some time left over and I'm just gonna focus on new things and specifically things that I learned from the group and that I have implemented so which is ongoing for me never ending in this group because I'm always getting a you know a idea or a suggestion from someone in the group but um, the first one is not necessarily a suggestion. It's just something I wanted to show you. And uh, I think Linda, Linda's linda been here and so have Bill and Pam. So they know this, but already. But I have asparagus. I planted it last year. Everybody knew I was planting it because I brought some starts some that I had left over um, to share. But anyway, I've been wanting asparagus forever because I love asparagus. I didn't know much about it, except you had to dig a pit and this and that. I read about it and it seemed like such a big deal, you know, but I ended up deciding to do it in a raised garden, which I'm very pleased with. And they, this year I didn't harvest, but next year I'll be able to, because I think anybody that knows anything about asparagus, and I knew this, that you can't harvest it until it's kind of a stronger plant. But what I'm interested to know or what I what surprised me maybe is 
how many people don't really visualize what it's like when you harvest asparagus because you know they're here first of all somebody said well that looks like an asparagus fern and I said yes it is it's an asparagus fern because it's asparagus because when you let it go to seed it does become a fern okay so anyway I'm going to share the screen first of all and show you I have a picture of um because this is what's kind of hard to picture is when you harvest the, oh, there it is. When you actually are harvesting um, asparagus. So, and this is what I saw, like I walked out early this spring and it's early and I saw these little asparagus ferns coming, or I'm sorry, spears of asparagus coming out of the ground. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I thought you would pick it off the plant or what, you know, like the plant would be there and but what really happens is, and, and this kind of explains better why it needs to be a stronger plant before you can harvest it, because it needs to be strong enough and big enough and established enough to produce multiple spears, you know, like this. And so really you go out there and when it's the right, you know, about the right size, you know, you cut it off with a knife, you cut it off real, with a sharp knife, and then they keep coming up. You know, and you harvest for up to eight weeks, I think, you know, that, that these things will come up and you cut them off and there you go, you got asparagus. And at the point when I guess they're kind of dwindling and looking worse or, or at the point that you just don't get it harvested and you just don't get out there, uh, that's when it starts to burn out because what it'll do, it'll just keep getting taller and taller. And as it gets, you know, a certain height, then that stock becomes more fibrous and hard and not not good to eat i mean it starts to build this strong base for the fern and that you know so whether you do that on purpose where you let it go or you went on vacation and you just didn't harvest and it went you knew you were going to let it go or if you just don't harvest it it will turn into a big fern and so i just thought that was interesting because myself i was kind of surprised when i went out there in the spring. Oh, look, that's what happens. So then this is what it looks like when it's burned out, you've let it go. So anyway, um, so, so uh -huh. I have a question. Yeah. So in the, like in the end of the season, in the winter, do you just let the weather kill it back and mm -hmm. then it starts over again in the next spring or how does that work? Well, it's a perennial. So, um, yes, you just, in fact, you just let it go. I didn't, I didn't cut that back until like, I don't know, either late, late, like late, late. It wasn't even fall. It was like early, early spring when I cut back the ferns because it does seed itself. See, I mean, it seeds, you know? And so, and it's not going to, you know, you just leave it there and whatever it is that the birdies can get to, they can just have it, you know, if they want those seeds, that's the other, that's become more of a reason for me to let some things go because I'm feeding nature. But um, I did. Um, you know what? Well, I'll answer this question because what happens is it gets all ferny and then it starts falling over, falling over. And I have it in a raised bed and it would just fall over into every path around it, you know, last year, which is like, okay, that's good. You're surviving, you know, but this year I looked it up and I thought I just put, should you stake it up? Cause I thought I need to stake it to kind of keep it in its own, you know, yard, you know, its own area. Um, so I looked it up and it said, yeah, you don't have to stake it because it won't hurt the, it won't weaken the plant or anything to fall over. In fact, it said, that's how it seeds itself. That's how it seeds is, you know, just going all over the place and starting new plants, I guess. But um, so I did stake it up because I thought, well, whatever you start, I want it to be right here anyway, you know, so um you'll see it's really, I mean, I decided aesthetically it's fine for where it is too. It just adds this whole other, you know, it's pretty, thing. Yeah. it's pretty. So anyway, I, I am going to spend the rest of this session just on stuff in my yard that I've done. So, and this is how we started anyway, Laura and Linda is just people showing each other like a walk in your garden, you know, anyway, but I am going to have to go out and come back in because I have to go onto my phone. So I'm going to say goodbye and then I'll come back in. That makes me want to grow asparagus now. <laughs>
I haven't Back to Terry's that. video. What were those tall red flowers towards the end? I know. I was wondering that too. They look like poppies or something. That's what I thought. That was really pretty. Yeah. Becky might know. Pam, do you know what they are? Those, those red flowers? You're muted. Oops. Still muted. <laughs> Oops, I guess I need there, turn my video on there. Oops, and I need to turn it around too. Let's see. Becky, we have a question. Yeah. On Terry's yeah. video toward the end, do you know what those tall red flowers were? They look kind of like poppy. I, they look like poppy, didn't they? I think they yeah. are. We'll have to ask them. Ask, but I think she does have poppy. I don't know if you can see the bluebird up there, but it's awesome. <laughs> you can't see it. No. So thrilled. The bluebirds out here. So here is the uh, raised garden, and it's glistening because of the rain. It's so pretty. It's so pretty. But um, you can see. Well, let's see. Hopefully. Um, it's kind of wet over here. I'm going to show you where the, the stalks continue to come up. Let's see. I had some that were shorter. Oh, there. Okay. Can you see that? You're frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh. I am. Not on this end. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I'm just seeing a picture of these. Uh -oh. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Oh, a picture? No. Okay. Well, it, not the one well, you said. I, I mean, it's just the frozen. Right. Shot. Well, shoot. I'm trying to use my cellular data because I there knew that might. Okay. All right. So there's the shoot that's coming up. Do you see it? Oops. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And that just uh, getting taller, you know. So how much I can see where it, it, uh huh. How much space does that take? I, well, I'm trying to get a, a feel for how big that this bed is. This is a this is a three by five raised oh. garden, and I didn't think that you could do it in a raised garden, but I I looked it up, and you can, you know. And I suppose if it's a horribly horribly cold winter, maybe it would. You know, it's above the ground kind of but it did very well last year and uh and and i you know i was i heard that yes i mean i found when i looked it up that you can do it in a raised garden because i kept thinking where am i gonna dig the you know the ditch <laughs> but anyway so um so another thing this uh, well laura you haven't seen this but this this is my like this is my little corner here that is um for the it's just my the, the sunniest part of my yard okay so it is my butterfly you know bees and birds kind of corner um your pollinator and I call this corner. my okay so there yes my pollinator yeah but i mean my house this is the front of my house and it used to be well i remember at the beginning they were like give me a long shot so here's my house okay and you go up to the porch there but then this sidewalk comes it comes from where you park to you know across in front of the house and then and then it turns a corner here He's frozen and, and we got sidewalk 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 uh oh we well i'm gonna keep talking for a minute so so it kind of stops right here it stops it's like a sidewalk to nowhere, right? I mean, why is there this? Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. 
there okay i'll skip to that then um i i did do zinnias from seed this year and the reason that i did that was because sarah and dinah were the ones i mean we've talked a lot about zinnias but sarah and dinah i remember them saying oh every year mom she just like broadcast she just did it from seed every year and they always had zinnias and i never had zinnias you know in fact, my mom is just really discovering zinnias and realizing how much she loves them. So yeah, those are from seed and um, I have high hopes for them because they're coming along. Uh, but back to the sidewalk to nowhere, um, this used to come right up to steps that went up to a wraparound porch right here because the house ended there. But then we added on 10 feet, which was a, di a dinette and a dining room. And so that's why all of a sudden we have this sidewalk, but there's no steps and there's no deck. And I always, at that point, I thought I envision this being a little corner, like, you know, somehow I thought at first it was going to just be a bird like sanctuary that we could look out the bay window and see, but it turned into this. And that, that was 2012 when we added that or 11, something like that. So um, the other thing, okay. So I'm going to show you the zine, speaking of zinnias last year. And bef I think even before that, uh, Carol Cordray had said she takes these I just bought zinnias you know already a flat of zinnias or something she said you just when you put them in the ground you just put six zinnias in a hole like and she said they they look like just bushes and they make such a wonderful border and I tried that this year and isn't that beautiful so thank you Carol I love that that was a really great idea I mean it looks better in person than it even did in her pictures, you know. Um, the other thing, last year, well, I was inspired to try to do some kind of a bird bath because um, by watching other, I think it was, uh, yeah, Mary Lee Comer had this beautiful bird bath bubbler. And I, I actually did a DIY one right here for, I had it for maybe three, two, two years, maybe. And I, and it just, the birds didn't come to it. And it just, I lost my joy with it. So I took that out this year and I put, um, I put a, another clematis cause you can see this one's still blooming. And I put another one there that I got at Avon Gardens, exactly like Linda's um, that will bloom in July and September. So it's a definite rebloomer. So I thought that would be nice. And then I put, um, Joanne Farrington gave me some starts on the dianthus, but I had one dianthus that I moved over here and I ended up getting a store-bought, uh, whoops, can you see that? Yeah, you can see that bubbler bird bath, right? I ended up getting a bird bath. <laughs> Jim said, you could just get one at the store. So I did. Am I frozen or anything? And you can see it from here and it's sort of just nestled in there which hopefully the birds will feel safe and you know it'll be one that they can really use when it when the summer gets super hot and dry you know so I'm happy about that uh, here Carol Cordray last year she mentioned that she had gotten this um, tomato that and they had this tomato plant that was really kind of compact and it didn't really bind and want to go everywhere. It just sort of, it didn't get super tall, but it just produced tomatoes all year round or the whole year, really good tomatoes. And she said that Larry had gotten them at Cox's. And so I actually did the research for the whole group at the time to say, what are those tomatoes that she's talking about? And I made a note that it was the better bush that they have the better bush tomato. And so I bought one and put it right here in this little corner. And isn't that lovely? Look, can you see my tomatoes? Look, <laughs> where are the oohs and the ahs? <laughs> I have tomatoes, people. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy with this thing. And I did have to stake it up. For some reason I thought, you know, it, it wouldn't need to be staked, but I did because it fell over and almost ruined my, the. Um, Shasta Daisy that's next to it. Um, okay, so let's see. 
here I have, I love the cat mint. It's blooming really nicely in early summer. Um, this is a Tradescantia, let, let me see. Can you, um, my, you can see my shadow real well. Can you see that one? It's, I've got it in just a little, little pot there. And this is, Cindy Vidal gave me a start of Tradescantia pallida. It's the purple heart plant. And it is, it's gonna, it blooms very pretty too. And I'm, that's just looking lovely. I mean, it was just this teeny tiny little start when she gave it to me last fall. So um, let's see. Um, another thing is I was inspired. Well, by the way, I've, I'm gonna try um, in my second raised garden, I'm gonna try sweet potatoes again, which I did sweet potatoes last year, but they were small. So, you know, I'm gonna try to do better. I mean, I had sweet potatoes, but they were really small and not very many. So don't ask me a whole lot about sweet potatoes. I'm gonna be doing a lot of looking up and, you know, like trying to do everything right. So I have better, better uh, harvest. Um, last year too, um, uh, Laura Essex, she showed us, she was showing us her garden and she had, it's a native, it's called Rattlesnake Master and it's in the yucca family and um, it, she had it in her native garden and it was behind her cone flowers in her and um, you know the black eyed Susans and it, it just got big and tall and then had this really interesting um, bloom and you can see I've got, I ended up getting three of them. Okay, so, and they look a little pathetic right now, if I were in here, but I knew that it would never have a chance, the new plant, because it doesn't get sunshine from behind, right? I mean, so I thought this isn't gonna work because it won't have a chance. It won't thrive without, it has to have full sun. So, this is kind of silly, we'll see how it goes, but I ended up buying outdoor grow lights and I've got them strung here uh, above the, above the uh, uh, rattlesnake master. And it's actually shining down on the zinnias too when I have them now, because I wanted it to, no, I'll not leave it on. That's an experiment to see if I can get this plant that has to have a lot of sun to grow up and come up beautifully behind the the others there so that's another big addition you can interrupt me anytime if you have any questions um let's see any questions because um, I, I really was going to focus on just maybe things i got from the group things, you know, ideas I got from the group. This is the orange butterfly weed, which I love. And I, I got these starts from Laura Essex a while back when she was, she used to sell them, you know, as a fundraiser for Jack. And these, these are um, the result of that. Um, oh, I know I, I did, I had some two rain barrels at one point and I had taken them both down and I put one back up here. So um, I'll have rainwater. I just decided I wanted to do that again. What I never did, cause I thought it was a little bit cheesy. You know, you see the pictures where you turn the lid upside down and plant things on the top of it. And I went ahead and did it. So this is something I just did this week. I know. Um, That's cheesy, Becky. Jim, help me. Uh -huh. That's what? cheesy, Becky. Is it cheesy? No, well, I'm kidding. I, I always thought it was, you know, you saw pictures of me and I'm like, I don't know about that, but I'm doing it. So this How is does the rainwater get into it. Well, it, um, it just hooks into your gutter. See, it's the kind that they have oh. at the church. Bill, Bill Smith put these in at, they're a different color, but it, with an irrigation system at our meeting house, you know, to just to help keep the, plants water and I thought well that's a good idea that's when I we had two we had one over there where actually where that bird bath is but anyway I they were just 
I, I ended up taking them out at one point because we couldn't get the irrigation to work anyway. And then the one, especially over here, was blocking so much sun that I couldn't get anything to grow, you know, on the other side of it. So, uh, but I decided, yeah, I think let's do that because the rainwater is nice to be able to, you know, water with rainwater when you don't have it. So, and then um, going along with my, um, one of the things this year was to incorporate more uh, natives. I did this, this section here, oops, okay. This section here, I don't know if you can see very well. Yeah, this is just a little area between the back deck steps and the house that I filled in with. Um, I've done this a long time ago, filled it in with ferns from my woods. But what I added this year was uh, it's a heart shaped, heart heart leaved aster. So I those are coming along really well. So they'll bloom in the fall, kind of a blue bloom or purple. But I've got like five of them in there. So that I thought that would be pretty, and they would be happy there. You know, should be. Um, I think that's about it. I was going to take you out to my entry, but we're out of time. Where are your because, cannas? Oh yeah, my cannas. Yes. And that's Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. I was going to, I've got that on my list too, because, uh, the, yes. Um, I don't know how many of us are, uh, are benefiting from Ellen's canna bulbs, but yeah, I, I, she gave me some last year. Can you see them coming? It's the, the sun is kind of working against us because here we go. There's one. Tell me you can see it. Can you see it? Them? Or am I frozen again? Because I don't hear anybody talk. I see him. Okay. Yeah, there's. So anyway, she gave these to me two. Oh, there's a two there too. She gave them to me two years ago. And then last year I dug my own bulbs up and saved them. So actually these are, you know, me trying to save them. So I put, so I've got one over here, but I all, but I planted them all along here to come up behind this stuff because even though it's more shady over here, I had them in a container over here. And they did reasonably well. So I thought I'll put some over here too. These aren't coming up quite as good as the other side. So that's it. We are out of time. Um, I don't want to go over. So that's it. This was a bad year for me to come, you know, to be somewhat uh, disabled on all this, you know because there were a lot of things I wanted to do. So let me try to turn this around. Oh, goodness. There we go. There. I'm back. So um, thank you all for coming. I, I feel like we're out of time. I'm, I'm glad to stay and chat. I don't want to keep you past since we said just 9.30 to 10.30, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to, oh, you know what I didn't show you? Um, I, I wanna show you this anthurium. No, I don't know. On my front porch, isn't that beautiful? Do you like that, Linda? Yes, <laughs> I like that. Where'd you get it? <laughs> Linda brought it to me. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. And it likes dappled, it likes dappled light. It doesn't like direct, so it does very well. I think it'll do very well on this porch. So, and it'll, it makes a great house plant too. So anyway, um, did we lose the Smiths? They probably got to their destination. Yes, yes. And they've seen my yard too, because I mean, they were over here a couple weeks ago. Yeah, they were over here not long ago. So that's motivating. Anyway. I need to get out and work in my yard. And this, <laughs> this is motivating for that. 
I, I've been practicing well, benign neglect. <laughs> well, when you don't feel well, it's hard. Yeah. You don't have any energy. And I feel, you yeah. know, working all day is really hard because by the time I get off work, even though it's a mental job and not a physical job, at the end of the workday, I don't, I have a list of things to do and I don't do them because I'm too tired. So I really need to. I totally can relate, Laura. I really can. And I think for me, just because this is, you know, my first full year, you know, season of being retired. I mean, I think I have a renewed enthusiasm, you know, and mm -hmm. as I'm sure would you, if, <laughs> if you were in that position of being able to focus on it, oh yeah, more, you know, intentionally and with more, you know, energy. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I believe it, I don't, for whatever reason, last year at the beginning of the season, I didn't really have a good reason. I mean, I couldn't say, well, I don't feel good. I'm having, you know, there wasn't a real specific reason or obvious reason, but I just was kind of in a slump. I remember going to Avon Gardens and just, we were walking through Avon Gardens as a group, this garden group. And I was just like, I can't, it was later, I think in the season and I hadn't done much. And I just was like, I just feel like I, I, can't, I can't feel motivated about anything. I was just almost depressed, you know, like walking mm -hmm. through going, I, you know, so it comes in waves too, depending on where you are mm -hmm. at that moment in your life, you know. And uh, yeah. I remember, yeah, Laura Essex, oh my gosh, seeing hers and going, oh, wow, wow. <laughs> you know, she, hers, but you know, that's, it does, it inspires you. And like, like you can see here, there, there's so many ideas and things that inspired me, you know, just to try that little thing of putting mm -hmm. six seniors in a hole, you know, and just, I don't know, it's just fun to. Yeah. share together and be inspired and yeah well I have a I have we have like raised garden beds with vegetables and we have flowers <laughs> in the front and in the back and the one I have in the back I had hopes for but I have lots of like blank areas that need to be filled in so maybe one of these days I'll, <laughs> I'll ask for advice for what I should put yeah. in those things <laughs> She's good at yeah. that. You should see mine. It's all Becky helped me with it. Yeah. And she she did all the work. Well, there's <laughs> a lot of people in the group that know a lot more than me. That's for sure. But everybody's like, I don't well, Laura, she is a professional. She, you know, she is definitely a professional in it, the whole thing. But mm -hmm. most of us are just we just like it and we've done it. And everybody will say, Well, I don't. Ellen Blackader, she'll say, well, I don't really, I'm not really the expert on it, but look at her place because she spent, what, 40 some years, you know, working on that same space, you know, and turning it into what it is now. And yeah, it's a humbling and humbling thing. And um, anyway, it will just... It will come. It yep. will. <laughs> well, um, so the next time we'll be together is um, July 9th. July 9th. Thank you. On Zoom. Yes, it'll be a Zoom again. All right. So, and then we'll, the very next week, it'll be two weeks in a row. We'll have the zoom and then we'll have being together at Laura's so all right um and we can stop the recording now we missed everybody that wasn't here hope you're doing well <laughs>